All right, welcome, friends, to the ongoing story of the life of Joseph and his family. Uh, today we're going to, uh, to conclude chapter 43, so if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis chapter 43. I'm not going to read the, uh, the story, actually. We're going to go uh, verse by verse and uh, take a look at what it has to say. Let's, uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. Our Father, thank you so much uh, for loving us. Thank you for the gift of your word. I pray, Lord, that you would speak to every heart, speak to every person who, who uh, desires to know you better. Reveal yourself to us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So I came across a, uh, an ancient saying um, from Egypt and it said, anyone who comes to Egypt and drinks from the Nile River will soon forget his native land. In other words, this land is, is so seductive that nobody can resist, that once you've seen and tasted of the pleasures of Egypt, you'll never want to go home again. Now, um, I'm more concerned personally about whether people will forget God than whether they forget their native land. And uh, definitely, I'm not the only person. I know that godly parents are, are concerned about uh, their sons and daughters going off to school or university um, because, unfortunately, very often the story is that they have forgotten God. We might say anyone who drinks from the waters of academia will soon forget his native faith. And there's a, a warning in, in Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, where Paul says, Oh, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. And it's not just academia. I mean, once we, once we enter into the world and uh, everyday life, many forget God when, when they start making new friends, when they start dating, when they... Uh, get married and have children. Uh, many forget God when they succeed in business and become VIPs. And so it could be said, it could be said of many that uh, when they drank from the Nile River, they, they forgot their faith. They forgot their God. But you know, there's one person that we know for sure did not forget God when he went off to Egypt, and that's Joseph. Um, he remembered God when he was at his father's house and when he was at Potiphar's house. Uh, he remembered God when he was a free man and when he became a slave. Um, he remembered the Lord when he was tempted by Potiphar's wife. When he was sent to prison, he remembered God. When he stood before the great Pharaoh, he remembered God. When he became second in command to all of Egypt, he remembered God. And he remembered God when he became the father of his children. All throughout his life, we continue to find that he remembered God. And Joseph's life really is a picture of Jesus, the uh, Messiah, who honored his father throughout his life. And whether he stood before paupers or princes, he remembered God. Whether he stood before friend or foe, he always spoke up for God. I mean, his enemies uh, observing his life said, Teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity. You are not swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. And then a Roman centurion said of Jesus, Surely he was a righteous man. So from his youth to his dying breath, he remembered God. Jesus knew his calling, and he fulfilled it. His last words were, It is finished. Father, I have completed the work that you have given me to do on earth. You know, when Joseph suffered at the hands of others, including um, his family, Joseph remembered God in a very specific way. He remembered that God was a God of grace and a God of mercy and that whoever had received this grace and mercy must now pass it on to others. So our theme for today is the theme of grace, extending it to others and how grace can be experienced uh, by others as well. 
Now, you may recall that the first trip to Egypt was very traumatic for, uh, for the brothers. I believe that the most important incident was when they began to feel the guilt of their sin. After 20 long years of having buried this sin deep within their souls, now uh, God was causing them to remember uh, their sin, what they did to their brother. And for the first time, they began to feel that God was wanting to address it with them. Again, we've mentioned this, guilt is unpleasant. Guilt is is not something that uh, anybody really looks forward to, uh, to experiencing. But it's necessary, true guilt, it is necessary to that we address it. If there's going to be healing in our lives, if there's going to be wholeness in our life, if there's going to be reconciliation, with others. Now I want us to uh, to begin reading verses 16 and uh, and 17. Actually, let me read from verse 15. Uh, so the men took the gifts and uh, double the amount of silver and Benjamin also. They hurried down to Egypt and presented themselves to Joseph. And when Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the steward of his house, "Take these men to my house." Slaughter an animal and prepare dinner. They are to eat with me at noon. And the man did as Joseph told him and took the men to Joseph's house. So this is um, the the second trip to Egypt. And uh, especially the first part of their experience um, during this second trip will be a very, very different experience than the first. Everything changes the moment Joseph sees Benjamin, the father's beloved son. Right away, good things begin to happen uh, to the brothers. They begin to experience grace and mercy. Um, And if we need a a simple definition, I'm just going to put it this way. Grace is being treated better than what we deserve, and mercy is not getting the justice we do deserve. But the first demonstration of grace is their experience of hospitality. The guys must have wondered, what on earth is this invitation to his home all about? I mean, who are we that we should be invited into the governor's house. What have we done to earn such a welcome? I mean, they could have said to the governor, you know, we are not worthy to be welcomed into your house. We're dirty. We haven't accomplished anything special in life. We've done our share of misdeeds. We have nothing but a food basket to offer you. Surely this must be a mistake. We don't deserve to be treated this way. Verse 18 tells us how they really felt and how they responded. Now the men were frightened when they were taken to his house, and they thought we were brought here because of the silver that was put back into our sacks the first time. He wants to attack us and overpower us and seize us as slaves and take our donkeys. So grace is being extended to them, but they're not experiencing grace. The men were afraid. Their response is not one of joy, but one of fear. And so they misread um, the governor's motives. And They're convinced that they're going to be accused, attacked, and that their property is going to be confiscated. So they can't enter into this experience of grace. They're suspicious. They think this is a trap, a trick. I mean, no Egyptian ruler is going to treat us with such kindness. And as for the money put in their sacks, um, they want to give it back. By the way, have we never have you never met folk like this uh, where they, they are just so filled with suspicion? Why are you being so nice to me? What is it that you want from me? What trap are you trying to set me up for? You know, I remember meeting a, um, an individual at Starbucks and he said he uh, he would never go to church 
definitely not with his wallet in his pocket. He said, you know, you walk in there and yeah, people might be really nice to you, but behind it all, they want to they want to take your property. They want to take your donkey. They want to take your money. Um, can we blame people for, for being so suspicious, so mistrusting? Unfortunately and sadly, for too many people, um, they have met folk uh, who have pretended to to care for them, pretended to uh, to be their friends, um, and in the end, they ended up doing great evil towards them. Some of you may be uh, following the story of uh, Ghislaine Maxwell, uh, Jeffrey Epstein's partner, and apparently she used to. Um, approach young vulnerable girls pretty girls and she showed interest in them and and uh, befriended them and offered them a career in modeling and uh, treated them like they were princesses and yet the whole time they were grooming them for prostitution and so the world has primed people not to trust other people not very easily And um, by the way, it's not just what other people do to us. It's also what we do to other people, certainly in the case of the brothers. In chapter 34, verse 28, the brothers offered the uh, Shechemites friendship and promised that there would be a mutual marriage between their tribes. And and yet when the uh, Shechemites um, let down their guard, the uh, the brothers killed every male, and then it says, and then they took everything, including their donkeys. So, you know, in their case, it's like, well, now they're going to doubt, you know, that grace is being offered to them because they know they've 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 participated in this kind of trick, and and uh, when you do that to other people, unfortunately then you're going to think that everybody's doing it to you. And boy, the counterfeit often looks like the real thing. But uh, they couldn't enter into the experience of, of grace here. Verses 19 to 22. So they went up to Joseph Stewart and spoke to him at the entrance to the house. Please, sir, they said, we came down here the first time to buy food, but at the place where we... We stopped for the night. We opened our sacks and each of us found his silver, the exact weight in the mouth of his sack. So we've brought it back with us. We've also brought additional silver with us to buy food. And we don't know who put our silver in our sacks. So um, this whole experience with the money in their sacks was has been a point of great anxiety for the brothers. I mean, it has given them no joy, no satisfaction at all to have that money in their sacks. Again, it can it uh, caused them fear. You know, again, true to life. When when uh, people in uh, in in uh, political office give people free money, you know that there's something that they want from you. Again, suspicion rules. What's the trap? Nobody gives strangers money like that. There must be some ulterior motive uh, for giving us free money, and that motive is not good. They want something from us. And again, we, we hate it when people do us evil, but we also don't trust people who do us good, right? And so unfortunately, sometimes what ends up happening is we live in this, in this culture of suspicion, and uh, may the Lord give us discernment. And then verse 23, verse 23. It's all right, said the steward. Don't be afraid. Your God, the God of your father, has given you treasure in your sacks. I received your silver. So uh, basically what he's saying to them is, hey guys, relax. Like, peace be unto you. Don't, Don't be afraid. And then he says, the giver of this money... The one who put this money in your sack is God, the God of your father. 
Now, this tells us something about Joseph's influence on this, Stuart, because it, it looks like um, he has put his faith in, in the living God. Um, and he's saying to, to them, don't you, don't you believe that God loves you, that God is concerned about you, that God is a God of grace and mercy? If we go back to chapter 42, verse 28, when they first discover the silver in their sacks, um, this is what they say, and this is what they experience as well. Their hearts sank, and they turned to each other trembling and said, What is this that God has done to us? Oh, yes, it is from God, all right, but God's intentions towards us? To hurt us, to punish us, to destroy us. So they're suspicious about God and what he's up to. And so again, because of their guilt and their ignorance and their mistrust, this, uh, this manifestation of God's grace and mercy towards them cannot be appreciated. They also, they, they, they couldn't fathom that God would want to do them good. After all, I mean, they had sinned greatly and grievously against God and their brother, and they experienced it on the first trip. And surely they, you know, God is only good to those who do good, not to those who have sinned, right? God is not merciful and forgiving to people who have done wrong. See, bad theology has consequences. That's definitely not the gospel of grace, but it's often how we live. We live under the law. We live under guilt. And notice in verse 23 how it ends. Um, and then they brought Simeon to them. You know, when people are slow to accept grace, we need to keep trying. Keep trying over and over and over again. And here, you know, a promise was made. And the brothers now saw that a promise was kept. Now, the promise was contingent. If you do your part, I will do my part. If you bring back your, younger, your youngest brother, then I will let Simeon go. And so, you know, if we're dealing with very suspicious people, um, then they, they need to experience consistency um, on the part of the believer. You know, there's that old saying or question, how do you know a politician is lying? Well, his lips are moving. And again, you know, that suggests a very real experience in the lives of so many. That's why there's so many people who are suspicious and distrust people in, in politics and uh, even in the media as well. Um, people have not been honest with us. And after a while, you just stop, you stop trusting, you stop listening. And if you want to regain trust, you need to let people need to know that you're going to be somebody who keeps your word. And then in verse 24, verse 24, the steward took the men into Joseph's house, gave them water to wash their feet and provided fodder for their donkeys. So they're told to sit down and then they're given some water. Now, some people believe that what this means is that the brothers themselves didn't end up washing their feet, that, that the, the servants of the governor, they washed the brothers' feet. They had been on this long trip, and now their feet is, are being washed. So they're being treated as honest, on, honored guests, because that's what you do when you have an honored guest. And then we read that the governor's servants go and feed their donkeys as well. Again, just imagine these suspicious people. What might have they been thinking? Um, you know, if we really are going to be in prison, why would they be washing our feet first? Now, that's a good question. Why is everybody being so thoughtful towards us? You know, hey, if this is a dream, don't wake me up. I feel like I'm somebody special. And the truth is, even, even their own father and probably their own families don't treat them this way. Grace makes people feel special. 
verses 25 and 26. And so they prepared their gifts for Joseph's arrival at noon because they had heard that they were to eat there. And when Joseph came home, they presented to him the gifts they had brought into the house, and they bowed down before him to the ground. So they give him this, um, I, I envision it as a kind of a food basket. Um, and, you know, maybe maybe it made them feel like, wow, we, we need to do something. We need to give something to feel deserving of all this, these gifts that, uh, that we're receiving. But you know what? Regarding this food basket, we don't hear about the food basket anymore in the story. It doesn't play any significant role. Uh, Joseph doesn't need it because, I mean, he has enough food. Uh, He's got enough food for himself and for, uh, for all the brothers. So what they give to him, what they bring to him, we don't know how he responds, but it seems to have no bearing on his actions at all. And I think this is important. His acts of grace and mercy are not dependent on the gifts that were given to him by the brothers. Now, in verse 26, and uh, we, we read this uh, happening again in verse 28, but it says they bow down, they, they prostrate themselves. And, uh, you know, some people may bow down because it's the cultural expectation, proper protocol. Uh, some may bow down because they are genuinely afraid of the person's authority. But I think that these brothers can now bow because they're in the presence of someone who has shown them grace. You know, we bow down to you because of your generosity towards us. Uh, We bow down to you because you've kept your promise and let our brother Simeon free. We bow down to you because we have been treated with such kindness and you know, as they're, as they're bowing down and prostrating themselves, uh, Joseph must have been thinking about his God-given dreams when in the dreams he saw his brothers bow down to him. I mean, God is all over this event. He's present in what is taking place here. Let's read verses 27 to 29. And he asked them how they were. And then he said, how's your aged father you told me about? Is he still living? And they replied, your servant, our father, is still alive and well. And they bowed low to pay him honor. And as he looked about and saw his brother Benjamin, his own mother's son, he asked, is this your youngest brother, the one you told me about? And he said, God be gracious to you, my son. You know, these these questions um, that he asks, obviously, are very personal. And they're caring, caring questions. Hey, how are you guys doing? Um, How was your trip? Tired, hungry? How's your dad? Hey, is this your brother? Again, they don't know really what to think or how to think about all this. I mean... Why, why is this man showing such, such concern for, for our family, right? They're not used to this. I mean, his conversation is what one would expect from someone that's interested in a personal relationship. And I think that Joseph is, is a great example of how we as Christians should be with all people, not just people in our own family, but with all people, because they are people. They are people made in the image of God. They are people whom God loves, who need to hear the gospel story. And I think a person of grace will take a genuine interest in people's lives. And uh, the latter part of verse 29 um, You know, Joseph, who never forgot God, never forgot to bring God into all the details of life, who also believed that nothing was important in life than knowing God and having God's blessings on one's life, he says to Benjamin, may God be gracious to you, my son. 
You know, this was the desire of Jacob when uh, when he sent his boys uh, to Egypt. May God Almighty grant you mercy before the man. That's his prayer. And uh, Joseph's Joseph's prayer, Joseph's blessing is may God be gracious to this young man. May he come to know your amazing grace, O Lord. Verses 30 and 31. Deeply moved at the sight of his brother, Joseph hurried out and looked for a place to weep. He went into his private room and went there. And after he had washed his face, he came out and controlling himself said, um, serve the food. So now we have a very moving scene. Joseph wept. Reminds us of that uh, passage in, in John chapter 11. Jesus wept. Um, Joseph's love here is deep and it's very personal. By the way, I would say that there's something very beautiful about this this love and yet there's something very tragic about this experience as well many are the wounds of a loving heart um, a parent loves a child but because of something that has happened in the past they've grown apart and the parent just just has this overwhelming love for their son or for their daughter, but um, they're they're not able to express their love to to the other person. They have to hold it in. Sometimes a child really loves a parent, but there's something something stopping him or her. Something there, something that they're not able to really c click and 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 connect. By the way, it's a picture of how Jesus felt as well. In Matthew 27, verse 37, he said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stoned those who sent, sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. So a heart may be full of love and unable to fully express it. Instead, they have to cry alone, they have to suffer alone, and the loved ones don't know how, they, how deeply they are loved. They don't know. But I, we can say that the heart of God longs for reconciliation and restoration, but until there's, there's repentance and acceptance of forgiveness, um, that intimacy, that depth cannot take place. Um, now, this doesn't mean that you can't continue to do good and show, do acts of kindness and extend grace to people. You can, but emotionally, there's always going to be some, some distance there. By the way, I think that the truth is that if the brothers knew who Joseph was, uh, they would have avoided him. If they discovered the first, during the first trip, they would have avoided him. They would have never talked to their dad about it. Uh, there would have been no second trip to Egypt. Um, maybe they would have sent somebody else. But uh, their fear of him would definitely have kept them away. And so Joseph would never have gotten an opportunity to reveal his identity and his love towards them. So... Knowing that, James, uh, Joseph has to play it smart. Uh, he has to keep his identity and his love a secret for the time being. Because one wrong move, and uh, they may disappear. Everything may change. Verse 32. Um, serve the food. Serve the food, Joseph says. And... Um, let me read that. 32. They served him by himself, the brothers by themselves, the Egyptians who ate with them by themselves, because Egyptians could not eat with Hebrews, for that is detestable to the Egyptians. 
So there's three tables. You, you know what uh, I call that? Social distancing. Even without the coronavirus, people, are, w w people were already practicing social distancing. And, you know, as we read these verses, we say, wow, look, you know, prejudice and racism is an old sin, just as slavery was. So these, there's these three tables set up, one for the brothers, one for the Egyptians, and one for the prime minister who eats alone. Right, so this, this gives us a, a window into Egyptian culture, but it, it also helps us understand the brothers and, and how difficult it must have been for them to understand what was going on. They, they were, hey, Egyptians don't show grace to people or to people of other nations. Like, what is going on? This is so unusual. The, uh, the life of Christ... I mean, Christ extended grace to people and often shattered some of these uh, taboos, these cultural taboos and social distancing. You know, in Luke chapter 15, verse 1, it says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Christian grace breaks down these, these racial and moral barriers. You know, because we say, you know, my dear friend, why are you sitting over there? You, you, I'm no more clean than you are. We're both unclean. You're no more worthy of the grace of God than I am. Um, there's only, you know, and on and on the list goes. There's only one, one Lord's table, not two, not three. There's not one for the Baptists and one for the Anglicans. There's not one for the clergy and one for the lay people. There's not one for serious sinners and another for uh, milder sinners. There's one table. And that's why we gather together uh, and as a family. Uh, nobody is better than the other. Nobody is more righteous. Our righteousness is found in Christ. And our boast is in him, not in our own uh, righteousness. But you know what? Joseph and his brothers are now closer than they have been for the past 20 years. Certainly, uh, from, uh, physically they are closer, but I think even more so than that. Uh, but still, there's no, there's no reconciliation between them that that hasn't happened yet all right they're still eating at several se separate tables but it's a movement in the right direction and then we read verse 33 the men had been seated before him in the order of their ages from the firstborn to the youngest and they looked at each other in astonishment so they're seated from the oldest to the youngest okay this was assigned seating. And the brothers are dumbfounded. This is so bizarre. Um, because how did they know to act what our age was? How did they know who the youngest is all the way down the line? You know, they're asking, how did he know this about our family? How does he have such intimate knowledge they must have so many questions, but no answers. Do you think by now that maybe they should have put two and two together and connected the dots? Easy to say that. You know, when people look out at the universe and they, uh, they see these amazing things in creation, and often there's these amazing providences of God, the way he brings people into our life and the way, you know, circumstances come together. And yet we, we see this and a lot of people just don't connect the dots. They don't. Yeah, so the brothers didn't connect the dots. They're amazed <clears throat> and they think it's pretty remarkable, everything that's going on, but they haven't connected the dots. And then verse 34, when, <coughs> excuse me, when portions were served to them from Joseph's table, Benjamin's portion was five times as much as anyone else's, so they feasted and drank freely with him. A couple of things, uh, a couple of observations from this text. 
Notice that the portions came not from the kitchen to each table, but rather from the, from the governor's table to each table. And I wonder if the purpose of that is so that people would, would understand that the gift of food and its abundance was not from the cook, it's not from the restaurant per se, but it came from the governor. It came from him. And I think this is a beautiful picture of how we should also remember that even that the gift of food comes not from the restaurant, not from the cook, not from the kitchen. We are grateful to all of them who, who prepare it. But ultimately, it comes from God. Give us this day our daily bread. And, you know, remember, there's a, there's a famine going on now. It's probably two years that have taken place now. And, uh, and here, all of them are feasting. And they must have said, you know, when was the last time that we ate a meal like this? And behold, so much food. They are experiencing an abundance. And if I could again just see this as teaching about grace, that God's grace is generous and it's filling and it's satisfying and it's something to celebrate and it makes us joyful. That is the grace of God experienced. But what do we make of this uh, this observation, this action on the part of the prime minister, that Benjamin's portions were five times as much. We would say, oh, here we go again. You know, those brothers, everywhere they go, they, they, they observe favoritism and privilege. And um, we want to say, careful, brothers, because somebody's watching you. Somebody is watching you. And they want to see, or he wants to see, if you're going to be envious, any signs of anger or wrath, any signs of hatred. And you know what? It seems that there's not, because the brothers seem to be able to feast and drink freely w with the governor. And when we experience the grace of God, you know what? We, we need no longer be controlled by envy and jealousy of others because we ourselves have experienced something that we do not deserve. Um, and Joseph may be testing them to see if his brother would be safe around them and whether they have any evil intent. That seems to be what's behind it. And they pass, they pass the test, it seems. And then um, chapter 44, verse 1. Now Joseph gave these instructions to the steward of his house. Fill the men's sacks with as much food as they can carry and put each man's silver in the mouth of his sack. <laughs> it's just gr an act of grace followed by an act of grace. It's just more and more grace. It's a diversity of grace. It's manifold grace. It's abundant grace. Where will it stop? And, uh, you know, Joseph commands his steward to give them as much food as they could carry to be as generous with them as they can, to give them back their money again. And, um, you know, we, we learn something beautiful about the grace of God and the gospel of grace. It's not about what we do or what we give to God. It's what he does for us out of the goodness and the kindness of his heart. So it's not how much works you have, how many good works you've done, it's not about how much money you, you pay. It's not about how much you've grown spiritually or in your knowledge of the scriptures. The gospel of grace is not about what we do. It's about what he does for us. Grace is not something that anyone ever merits. We don't earn grace. It's given to us 
who are undeserving. That's the story of grace that we read in, in this chapter. Now, by the way, if the story had ended in, in chapter 44, verse 1, this would have been the best trip ever because everything seems to be going extremely well. But, but of course, you know, there's no heaven on earth. Um, something always happens to throw a wrench into the plans. And uh, we... Uh, we're going to look at chapter 44 next Sunday, and uh, we're going to see that uh, that uh, there's going to be a trial that they're going to have to go through. But in the meantime, right up to this very point, I mean, things are going good. And I just want to say, enjoy it while it's going good. Enjoy it while it lasts. Let me just uh, conclude with this final thought. Um, Joseph, he knew his brothers. He knew them by name. He knew their story. He knew what they had done. But they did not know him. They knew their own sin, but they didn't know how willing Joseph was to forgiving them. They did not know how he longed to be reconciled with them. They didn't know how, how deep was his longing to reveal himself to them. But he who knew them best still loved them most. Again, reminds me of the story of the Samaritan woman when she meets Jesus at the well. And after she's converted, she runs back and says, Come and see this man who told me everything I have ever done. I mean, she was amazed that Jesus could know her so well and yet still save her and reveal himself to her. You know, when you start encountering God and his grace, strange and inexplicable things begin to happen in life. You begin to see it in your circumstances. He begins to, the way he orchestrates your circumstances, it's the grace of God. God's grace is, is surprising. It's amazing. It's mysterious. And I want to say to everybody who's listening, God knows your name. He knows your every thought. He knows your every sin. And he knows that you've forgotten him for many years in your life. He knows that you've backslidden some of you from him. But today, I want to focus on grace. I want to share God's heart with you. Believe that he longs to be reconciled with you. Believe that he loves you still. Believe that he's willing to forgive you and wants to bless you. Ask Jesus to come into your life. Bow the knee to him because he is the Lord and because of all that he has done. And I pray that you may know the gospel of grace that is offered in this free gift of salvation in the person of Jesus. And may you be so filled with his grace that you may once again feel complete, experience healing, and that you may be joyful and Mary. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless.